Good evening. Welcome to the League of Women Voters of Snohomish County Forum for candidates for Washington State Senator for Legislative District 32. I'm the moderator, Karen Madsen, member of the League of Women Voters of Snohomish County. And with me are the candidates, three of them for Senator, Ledge District 32. They are Patricia Weber, Jesse Solomon, and Evelyn Anthony. As always, the League has invited all the candidates, and in this case, we're fortunate enough to have all of them with us tonight. The League thanks all of you. On behalf of the League, I thank all of you for running for office, for your willingness to serve the community if you're elected, and for participating in this forum. It's the policy of the League to be nonpartisan. Therefore, we do not endorse or oppose candidates or parties. We do, however, take position on issues which we've studied and upon which we've reached consensus. Ground rules for the forum were sent ahead of time to all the candidates, and candidates have agreed to abide by the stated rules of decorum and will refrain from interrupting personal attacks or disruptive behavior. These rules will be strictly enforced. Let me briefly explain the question and answer period situation. Questions have not been shared with the candidates. We do thank all those who sent us recommendations and questions about local issues. I'll pose the questions. Each of you, each candidate will have 90 seconds to respond. A little less time or a little more time may be allowed for selected questions. If there is a change in the time allowed for the question, I'll make sure everybody understands that clearly, including the timer, and you'll see the different timing reflected on the timer. We're using a countdown timer visible to all candidates. It shows elapsed time and alerts the candidate when there are 15 seconds left and when time is up. Time limits on answers will be strictly enforced. When you see the timer turn red and you hear the chime, no more words. The order of question. I'll change the starting order for each question, rotating through the candidates to ensure a random and a fair sequence. We did this randomly before the forum started and the order turns out to be this. Ms. Anthony will go first on the first question, Mr. Solomon second and Ms. Weber third. Then on the second question, Mr. Solomon will go first, Ms. Weber, then Ms. Anthony, and we'll rotate through like that. So with all of that explanation, Ms. Anthony, here's the first question for you. You'll have 90 seconds. What qualifications and experience make you a strong candidate for this position? Uh, well, I'm very active in the uh, Shoreline community. I sit on the board of film and performance art at Shoreline Community College. I've also been a hip hop activist for over 25 years. Hip hop isn't just a uh, music, it's also a culture. It's one of the fastest growing cultures in the world. Um, I've been very involved in Seattle uh, politics, human rights, human, uh, human rights movement, peace activism, police accountability. I have also spent time as a precinct committee officer in my neighborhood. I'm on my third term. And then I also am an educator. So I spend a lot of time with the youth and uh, a lot of time with the elderly. And I just spend a lot of time in the community trying to gauge where we are, where we've been and where we're trying to go. Um, I feel that I'm a bridge builder and I am able to talk to both sides of the aisle because I've been both a liberal and a conservative. And I feel that we're um, kind of speaking the same language, but just in different, uh, maybe in a different cadence. And so I feel that I'm uniquely qualified to, to be able to do that in many different uh, arenas because of my background as an artist. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Solomon, same question. Thank you. Uh, so I'm, and thanks everybody for being here. Thanks for having me. I'm running for re-election after finishing my first uh, four-year term as your state senator. Uh, it's been a, a deeply meaningful experience and serving here has been, frankly, the honor of my life. Um, before that, I was on the Shoreline City Council for seven years uh, and I was the deputy mayor of Shoreline uh, five years ago when I decided to run for the state Senate. Uh, I'm a 40 year resident of the Seattle slash shoreline area. Uh, I went to Garfield High School in Seattle uh, some time ago. 
and uh, graduated from Western Washington University and then earned my uh, JD law degree from uh, University of Washington in Seattle. Uh, after which I practiced uh, at the Lummi Nation doing uh, child welfare, uh, dealing with uh, child abuse cases and, and um, protecting children through the, through the tribal court system, um, placing kids in foster care, out of foster care, things like that. Uh, after that, I worked for about 15 years as a public defender, public defense attorney, uh, while also serving on the Shoreline City Council. Um, and uh, that's that's about my time. So thank you. You're very welcome. Ms. Weber, same question to you. Thank you. And thank you for having me. I have lived in Shoreline for over 30 years, raised my son going through the public schools. I have served as a physician at the Fircrest RHC here in Shoreline for 30 years. That is a state residential facility. So having been a state employee, I know both the effects of having to deal with legislation and whether it's positive or negative. I am looking forward to, in, to starting legislation that can serve everybody, that can be a positive influence. I'm very, very happy to say I have the sole endorsement of the 32nd LD and the King County Democrats. I'm recently retired and I'm looking forward to having the next few years committed to both human and environmental welfare. Thank you. You're very welcome. Mr. Solomon, you'll take the lead on our next question. And that is, what are two or three major issues that need to be addressed by the legislature? Uh, gun safety, uh, Roe v. Wade are two major ones. And I'd say mental health as the third. Um, the, there, I think there's gonna be a renewed push for an assault weapons ban uh, for obvious reasons, which I support. I, I think it's insane that we have to wait for a tragedy to move forward on things, um, but sometimes that's the way it is. Although I will say that aside from the fact that we haven't passed an assault weapons ban, we've done a lot uh, on gun, uh, reasonable gun regulations, including banning open carry at, at protests, uh, at uh, local school board meetings, at um, uh, city councils, things like that. Uh, and so I have a, a, a number of bills that I'm working on uh, around uh, concealed pistol license training, things like that. Uh, on Roe v. Wade, if that is in fact overturned, we are working to make sure that there are li liability protections for providers. Um, so we're planning what to do during next uh, legislative session in that regard. Uh, I want to fight any extradition that essentially uh, pregnant people from other states might face if they come here for medical care. And then mental health, we've, uh, put about $500 million recently into the system. I have a bill uh, following the Blake ruling around um, civil enforcement of drug laws. Uh, because we need some. Thank you so much, Mr. Solomon, appreciate it. Ms. Weber, you're up next on this one. Thank you. My priorities would be number one, healthcare, and primarily access to that healthcare. Even though we have a fairly good state supported insurance program. There are still over half a million individuals in Washington that do not have health insurance. And again, just having health insurance does not guarantee you access to any of those health clinics. I particularly would like to address women's health care and the whole spectrum of women's health care, all of which should be a decision and discussion between her and her physician. There should not be governmental interference. Another very important aspect, as was already mentioned, is mental health. Again, our access to mental health is very poor. We're about 31st in the nation, and we need to improve that. The second is housing, a very, very common complaint throughout the state, throughout the country, 
housing and affordability. Even though we have great development, the affordability has not followed. Thirdly, the environment. This is such a beautiful state and we all enjoy living here so much. We need to protect it. We need to protect all those aspects that make it beautiful and a healthy place to live. Thank you. Ms. Anthony, could you weigh in on that question as well? Absolutely. Uh, one of my uh, priorities talking to my constituents is the crime and violence that has overtaken our streets. Uh, the kind of conversations that we need to have between a fair balance between mental health care and also uh, holding people accountable for the crimes that they are committing. Uh, the communities feel very unsafe. They don't feel heard. And so that's a, a, a huge priority uh, for I feel the legislature, legislature needs to address. Um, the other one I feel is economic development. And uh, personally, I feel that where we need to focus a lot of our economic development is in the arts. Uh, Seattle's reputation around the world is not that great. And one of the things that Seattle is known for it, are its arts and its culture. And we have already done a creative economy impact about how much money gets brought into the region. And I think if we focus on community development and revitalization, revitalization through the arts, that we'll be able to attract tourism back here. We'll be able to um, replenish the economy and, and arts uh, helps with mental health and healing. And so these are the things that I'm hearing um, as I'm out talking to people. Thank you. You're very welcome. We'll move on to the topic of homelessness with the simple question. Please speak to ways that you would address homelessness. And Ms. Weber, you'll take the lead on this one. I would like to investigate. We've all seen massive developments in these huge apartment complexes. And as I mentioned, affordability still isn't following that. I'd like to know why. I'd like to know and investigate the role that corporations are playing in this lack of affordability. I would like to make sure that as more development is, is done or approved, that there is a guarantee of low income housing. There's a project that we could model being done in Newark, New Jersey, where they have various strata of housing and include, so in 60 units, they include at least 15 of those being low income housing. Then those people can move on to the other strata of housing as their situation improves. They can stay in the neighborhood, they can stay with their community, they can keep their relationships that they've developed. They don't have to be just relegated to a low income housing area and, and then leave that community. I know there are legal questions regarding rent control, but I'd like to know more about that and how can we perhaps bring that in. Ms. Anthony, your thoughts on homelessness? I feel that it's an issue that needs to be looked at holistically. There are different reasons in different levels of homelessness. I don't know if this organization still exists, but uh, when I was doing homeless work back in the early 2000s, there was an organization here called First Place. And so, you know, they dealt with the women that were homeless for domestic abuse. They had um, housing that was uh, not readily, the information about where these houses were was not made to the public to keep the women safe. The children had say, uh, uh, changed schools, so they had a school there. And they were looking at the whole person because a lot of these people, um, they don't sustain the housing once we get it to them. So it, it really needs to be a different uh, it, holistic view of it, the different levels of homelessness, what's involving domestic violence, um, uh, uh, substance abuse, uh, or if it's just an economic thing. And I think what we do is we just throw money at it and build housing and that's not necessarily been an effective approach. Thank you. Mr. Solomon, you have the last word on this one. Yeah, I actually will agree with Evelyn Anthony that there's um, many factors for homelessness. Uh, some of it is economic, housing is overpriced, it's insane. Um, and some of it is behavioral health. 
Uh, and some of it is just bad behavior that we tolerate. I was driving my son to daycare this morning and I saw somebody shooting up drugs on the sidewalk during daylight in front of the daycare. And I don't know why we accept that behavior. So we have to have a multifaceted approach. And um, I've passed bills or have introduced bills to address many of those facets. So on housing, um, I passed a bill last year, 5818, to make it easier and cheaper, take away some of the red tape to build smaller uh, housing. So not the McMansions that I saw my neighborhood that I grew up in get replaced with, right? You're tearing down 1,500 square foot houses and putting up 4,500. That puts the affordability way out of hand. So incentivizing those smaller houses um, and apartments. Uh, so I've done that. We're going to keep working on that. Um, but also, um, I have a bill that would require people to do treatment if they're caught um, using drugs. Uh, it would not be a criminal offense, it'd be a civil offense, uh, but they'd be found in contempt of court if they sort of blow it off, right? If they don't come to court as required. Uh, so generally speaking, we need a carrot and a stick approach. Um, a lot of things that go into this issue. Thank you very much. Ms. Anthony, you're back in the lead with this question. As hospital mergers happen with greater frequency, do you have concerns about limited healthcare options in religious hospital systems? What actions, if any, would you recommend? Well, well, cutting out the red tape is a huge issue. I feel that the insurance companies play a huge role in the chaos that's going on uh, with our medical system. Um, I have a friend that has started a um, private members association for doctors and nurses and practitioners that are leaving the medical field simply because they got into the medical field to be healers and not to fill out insurance paperwork. So when you get all these mergers and, and all of this uncertainty, I think it puts a lot of stress on the practitioners that are supposed to be healers. And then it just uh, overloads the system. And then when you have people in inadequate housing, then they become a burden on the system because the, the landlords aren't taking care of the housing or taking care of the, um, the housing. So then the health is bad. So it's one vicious cycle that I feel that we have to deconstruct and then reconstruct again to be supportive of both the medical practitioners and also um, holding the hospitals accountable for um, the excess uh, things that are going on and, and the people are suffering by not being able to have options or being able to get uh, appointments in a timely manner. Thank you. You're very welcome, Mr. Solomon. Thank you. Um, yes, I'm extremely concerned about conglomeration of hospitals into the hands of religious organizations because uh, that can lead to a limitation on service provision around abortion care, around reproductive health and parity. Uh, so I signed on as a co-sponsor to Senator Emily Randall's uh, bill last year that would essentially make it harder uh, to, to have these conglomerations. Uh, and it would analyze, uh, it would empower the attorney general to analyze these uh, mergers to make sure that we're not losing uh, those capabilities. Uh, so I do absolutely think we need to fight back, push back against some of that. Thank you. Ms. Weber? Thank you. Well, apparently, we, we already follow um, the separation of church and state. Apparently, now we've got to do the separation of church and medical care because it is becoming a problem. It was already mentioned that we may have refugees from other states. Well, if they come to our state and the only local hospital is, say, a Catholic-run hospital, they're, they're going to be at a loss yet again. Just as I said, the government shouldn't interfere between women's health care, all aspects of women's health care. Neither should a religious organization when it is a generalized topic such as health care. What people don't some people don't know, and I only found out recently in Catholic hospitals, outside of the argument of abortion, any delivery, any baby, 
regardless of its condition, regardless of its ability to survive, must be resuscitated. And that can do terrible damage to the emotional damage to the parents, as well as physical trauma to the baby. Thank you. Mr. Solomon, this next question comes to you first. How could the education funding system be adjusted to continue to improve equity in public schools, even in the event of a local levy failure? That's, that's a good but complicated question. What I, I, I'd say to some extent, we need to let the system work. Four years ago, McCleary, the McCleary decision, the Supreme Court said we were not um, as a state funding uh, education equally statewide uh, sufficient that all districts are getting their basic education needs and requirements met. Um, so property taxes are in this district increased about $1,000 per house. And that money was essentially sent to the state to go towards other districts that hadn't been um, well, that they had a low uh, pro property value. So they weren't a, you know, able to fund. It wasn't necessarily that they weren't voting for levies. Um, the, the, it was problematic that basic education funding had to rely on levies. So now the state funds uh, a, a basic model uh, for, for every district. Um, I think it begs the question of sort of how much, okay, if we're not locally using levies, for basic education, but we want to have excellence in our school districts and, and we want to voluntarily tax ourselves, uh, what level should we be able to? Because it's been capped uh, 20, about 24% uh, under McCleary. Um, so I think we need to have that discussion. Ms. Weber, your thoughts? I'm going to reiterate that it's very complicated. I know that school funding, the amount spent by the state is mandated. So it can't, theoretically, it cannot be touched. And that is about, I think it's either 53 or 56% of our state budget goes toward education. I'm sure the state itself, if localities won't do it, the state itself can add monies to that. That begs the question of about of how we get those funding and the, and the state's increase in funding or receiving funds from the population. Perhaps addressing some of those special services, which is what where the state itself adds to the budget for specialized services, both for those of lower skills and higher skills, as well as we've mentioned the arts and other peripheral means of education to supplement what the school offers. Thank you. Ms. Anthony. <laughs> I agree, it's a very complicated subject. Um, when my son was in elementary school, you know, he, he li we lived in districts where the the schools weren't very well kept and they had to do uh, popcorn fundraisers and things like that for a boiler that kept breaking. I think it's important to involve the community, listen to the community because there's a lot of issues in our school that if they were solved between the students, the teachers and the community, I think that the funding uh, solution would fix itself. But because there's being so many, there's so many things being ignored that are going on in the schools that people aren't that interested in uh, funding schools that continue to turn out the same chaos and confusion all of the time. Um, I was a part of when Garfield High School was remodeling and part of the reason they were doing that is because the separation between the African-American kids and the uh, uh, AP, AP kids and the amount of funding that was going in there. So I think that we need to figure out transparency for the funding that we have now before we even ask for more funding and get the community involved in how that is delineated amongst the districts. Thank you. You're very welcome. 
Uh, Ms. Weber, you'll lead off on this one, and it has to do with redistricting. Are there changes you would support to the Washington state redistricting process? If so, what would those be? Sorry, hit the wrong key. I don't have a cohesive answer for that. I think we're all a little disappointed in the, the characteristics of some of these districts with the little isthmuses here and peninsulas there within the districts. A lot of that is done for to address elections of that year of the redistricting, and then we have to live with it for the next 10 years. It's such a major undertaking. I'm not sure I could advocate for having it happen more frequently and trying to make it more even. I think we do well in that it's usually formed by committee and, and discussion within that committee. I honestly, I feel like it needs to be improved. I honestly not am not sure how to propose that yet. Thank you. You're welcome. Ms. Anthony? I feel like that is such an intense subject, especially when we each each side of the political aisle accuses the other of improprieties when we have these discussions. And I'm a proponent for you know, um, bringing the communities in when, when we have these discussions so that we have the shared resources, we have the shared re uh, representation, and that we all know which direction we're trying to take the district and, and the purpose behind the redistricting. I think the purpose behind the redistricting always gets lost and we buy into whatever um, narrative is out there for the redistricting and there may be actually a great reason for it, uh, but for the information hasn't been put out to the community about why this would be good or why this would be bad and how this would be benefit the community or not. So um, I think that's something we have to deconstruct a little more and work together cohesively. Thank you. Mr. Solomon, redistricting thoughts? Yeah, so I think the reason you're asking that question is because there was arguably, or there was an allegation of a violation of the Open Public Meetings Act by some of the Washington State Redistricting Commissioners. Um, what I would say is, you know, that doesn't mean we have a bad system. That means that we may have had bad behavior. And those are two very different things. And there are ways to address a violation of the Open Public Meetings Act. Our redistricting method actually is less partisan uh, than most. Uh, so we have two Democrats, two Republicans that have to agree, otherwise he gets kicked up to the courts. Um, and what that tends to lead to is a status quo. Um, so you don't see when one party comes into power that they cement remaining districts in their favor, right? Uh, in Washington state. And that's a good thing. You want swing districts because that's responsive. Uh, are probably our, one of our, if not our biggest challenges and dangers to democracy is that in other states, you have uh, partisan gerrymandering in the extreme. Uh, and I will actually say that I think it's a fact that the Republicans did that to an extreme starting in 2010, such that Democrats need a greater majority of votes, more than 50% in well over 50% to get a congressional majority. Um, and so that's an abuse of redistricting. We don't have that here. We actually have a pretty good system. Thank you very much. Ms. Anthony, back to you in the lead again with this question. If the U.S. Supreme Court were to overturn Roe versus Wade, would you support making any changes to existing state laws regarding access to abortion? I, I support the fact that Washington State supports a woman's right to choose and that we're leaving that decision up between her and her healthcare provider. And I was very encouraged to hear what Mr. Solomon said about the role that we would play should the Supreme Court kick this uh, topic back into our backyard. 
And uh, I feel that the women of Washington state have spoken and they've said uh, what they, what their preference is. And so it would be our job as legislatures uh, to be able to implement uh, the type of healthcare uh, provisions and everything that they're asking us to uh, secure their right to choose. Um, so that's how I feel about it. Uh, having it kicked back to the states, I think, especially in Washington state, I think we have the uh, ability to actually uh, set an example and to maybe be the vanguard as to how sensitive the situation is and how it really should be left up to a, uh, a, a woman and her doctor. Thank you. Thanks for your response, Mr. Solomon. If Roe v. Wade is overturned, all bets are off, okay? However, Washington State's legislature and governor are already pro-choice, highly pro-choice. So we already have um, significant uh, protections and support for a woman's right to choose. Um, you could say that we could do better in terms of funding, get public funding for abortion services. And I believe that you will see a very large uh, maybe 400% increase in that funding. Uh, because we recognize, look, I'm wearing a, a Ukraine colored uh, pin here uh, because one core value that I have is standing up for other people who are being victimized, even if they're not in my country or in this case, my state. But we recognize that there will be pregnant people from other states who will need care here. And so the legislation that we need um, will have to do with uh, enforcing, you know, protecting against uh, liability abortion providers, uh, people who get the services, uh, and we need to make sure that we increase funding for, I guess you could say, refugees from other states. And uh, the fact that I have to say that word about something taking place in, in our nation is sad, but I think it's on point. Um, and I, I'm just sorry that we have to be there that spot. Ms. Weber, would you care to weigh in on this one? Yes, I think I've already stated my positive position towards women's health and personal private women's health. I have felt somewhat secure and I hope it's not a false security within Washington state because again, we have such very good widespread support for women's health a woman's right to choose, a woman's right to determine her destiny. My current concern, because I feel secure about Washington state is if in the election of 2020, if Roe v. Wade is overturned, that gives us two years to work because if the election of 2024 gives us a Republican majority, they are already talking about making a national ban not just leaving it up to each state, making it a national ban. If that were to occur, how does the state of Washington address that? What methodology, what, I, I can't tell you which laws, but what legal approach can we do to exempt ourselves from a national ban? That is where my current worries dwell. Thank you. Mr. Solomon, your opportunity to go first presents itself now. What legislation will you support to address the need for local responses to climate change, including through the Comprehensive Plans for the Growth Management Act? Well, thank you. I actually introduced a bill, uh, a companion bill in the Senate uh, that makes uh, carbon emissions a element of growth management planning. So right now under the Growth Management Act, uh, you have to plan for transportation and transportation impacts. If you're gonna build a building, uh, you have to pay for its transportation impacts, right? You can't just build it and then forget about it. So um, there's a whole host of subjects that fall under that rubric under the Growth Management Act. And this would add climate change. 
which would have the effect of encouraging mass transit, reducing vehicle miles traveled, uh, things of, of that nature. Um, that bill did pass the House last year. Um, you know, sometimes we send a bill over to the House, sometimes they send it to us, uh, but we didn't have the votes to get it through um, the Senate this last year. I don't know if we will in the future. We did pass the Climate Commitment Act, which is a cap and trade, revolutionary cap and trade bill that puts us on par with California. And I was the, uh, I was a co-sponsor of that bill uh, and the low carbon fuel standards bill. So we have done yeoman's work, I would say, on climate change. Thank you so much, Ms. Weber. And I'm sorry, could you repeat that question? I missed the first part. Absolutely, no need to be sorry. What legislation would you support to address the need for local responses to climate change, including through the Comprehensive Plans for the Growth Management Act? Thank you. Well, I do think we should adhere to the Growth Management Act. I think there are localities, individual localities that are trying to ease their way around the Growth Management Act with some specific exemptions for this, that, and the other thing. I think we should not allow exemptions to the Growth Management Act itself. I'm not sure if fossil fuels play into this, but I am totally in agreement with reducing the use of fossil fuels. This may reduce some of the need for, for more road building. Road building, although it's needed because of the, the capacity, the current capacity of the roads is now almost overrun, that detracts from the local environment at the same time when you're building and expanding roadways. Thank you. You're welcome, Ms. Anthony. Yes, um, I would support legislation that really deconstructed climate change because it's such a huge uh, topic. And I don't think a lot of people have uh, understood it because it's been rebranded and rebranded and rebranded. And so there's a lot of pushback from uh, communities to uh, change their personal behaviors that would help with our environment. So I think that that's a first step in um, getting the community involved. I don't feel that as a legislature, um, I can you know, say, well, this is the legislation that I would put forward. I'm, I'm very much involved in, uh, into having town halls, into deconstructing situation, deconstructing, deconstructing legislation and initiatives and ideals and ideas into um, uh, discernible sound bites that people can know and understand so that they can be a part of us uh, creating a greater Washington that in includes us taking care of our environment. Thank you. Ms. Weber, you're up first on this one. What do you believe are the three best ideas for reducing the likelihood of violent firearms incidents in our county and our state? Another reason I'm proud to live in Washington, I think we have made good progress reducing the high capacity magazines, uh, the red flag laws, some of the other restrictions that are coming up uh, towards carrying guns or even owning guns. Ways to reduce this, especially in public, well, in public, let's particularly in schools, that's been the most recent topic of conversation. I'd like to see more mental health availability within the schools. I like to say, I'd actually like to see high schools, high schools particularly, and especially those high schools that are very close to or neighboring middle schools and elementary schools. If we had a health clinic on site 
again, with a lot of mental health emphasis within that health clinic. So it's easily available to the students, particularly those students whose families perhaps can't afford it or can't get them access any other way. There is a model for that that was built by Kim Schreier down in Southern part of King County. And that would be a good model to, for the state to follow in other high school areas. Ms. Anthony, your thoughts? Can you re repeat the question, please? Happy to. What do you believe are the three best ideas for reducing the likelihood of violent firearms incidents in our county and state? More after school, pro pro uh, more after school programs before and after school problem um, programs for our young people. Uh, my main concern is uh, the guns that aren't getting uh, distributed to people legally. Uh, I myself am a gun, gun owner and feel like I went through a very thorough background check and a waiting period um, to get my firearm. Um, I'm concerned about the south end of Seattle where young 12 and 13 and 14 year old kids are murdering each other. They're not getting these guns le uh, legally. And I don't feel like we have addressed enough uh, of the illegal firearms. Where are they coming from? How are they getting them? Um, because most of the people that uh, commit crimes, they're not going through the legal channels of getting a firearm. And I don't think that that is a part of the discussion. Also, I think that the discussion is, is, is one-sided to where um, now we're talking about um, uh, penalizing legal gun owners that are very safe with their firearms. And we're not 12 and 13 year old children running around shooting each other and joining gangs. So I think that both things uh, um, need to be addressed uh, simultaneously if we're gonna get serious about uh, gun restrictions in, in our state. Thank you. You're very welcome, Mr. Solomon. My understanding is that the shooter in Uvalde, Texas, bought an assault rifle legally. Um, feel free somebody to correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I think that shows uh, a huge problem and a huge flaw. Um, so I, I, I think if you just look at the statistics and the data, an assault weapons ban uh, will be one of the most immediate positive effects, but it will not be, you know, it might reduce things by like 10%. We read, we passed a bill limiting ammunition clips uh, that may cut down on the lethality of shootings. So that's another 5%, but these, you know, we're going to be chipping away at this um, and we're never going to unfortunately solve, you know, all human violence problems, but I think we can certainly move forward. Uh, I introduced a bill in 2019 uh, for concealed pistol license holders that they would actually need to be trained on firearms. Revolutionary concept, right? You have to be able to shoot straight, not shoot the wrong person. And that's a, a law they had in Texas at, at the time. Uh, they changed that law. Uh, and I'll be reintroducing that. Also, extreme risk protection orders. So there are laws on the books where guns can be seized from people under ex, who are under mental duress, suicidal, et cetera. Um, but only really being enforced uh, rigorously in King County. So we need to work with the police to give them an incentive, both financially and maybe with a stick, uh, to get them to do their job and take uh, those guns. Thank you so them. much. Appreciate it. Let's see who starts off with the next one? Um, Ms. Anthony. Okay. If elected, what ideas do you have for working productively with your staff, colleagues, and members of the public whose ideas are different from yours? Well, I'm um, very skilled <laughs> at doing that. I'm an African-American woman that was raised in a military town that was an all-white community by a Native American mother and an African-American father. I have a uh, long uh, body of work in dealing with uh, different sides of the aisle. In fact, I sit on the uh, Braver Angels, Washington, Western Washington Steering Committee. Uh, they're a national organization that does depolarization work. So at least two or three times a month, I spend time uh, uh, participating in workshops with people from both sides of the aisle where we find common ground and we learn how to uh, treat each other respectfully. Everybody goes through trainings to be able to do that. 
Um, and I'm, I'm an artist. And so um, I can empathize with all people. I can walk a mile in their shoes. If I can play them on a screen, I can definitely walk a mile in their shoes and be able to bring people together to be able to listen to each other and not talk at one another. So I feel that that's what I bring to the table and I'm able to um, reach across aisles of um, culture, of religion and in, in, of the human family in Seattle. And I'm very well known in Seattle as a social justice activist. So that's how I feel. Thank you. You're very welcome, Mr. Solomon. Thank you. Um, you know, sometimes it feels like increasingly Democrats and Republicans have completely different sensibilities. What's common sense to one is not common sense to another. Um, and there are forces at work, uh, you know, polarizing forces, whether it's aspects of Facebook or Fox News, um, that seek to feed that. And I think what they're doing is working. And I think it's really quite dangerous for our democracy. Uh, I see myself uh, as a bridge. Gone are the days where we don't move any bill because we don't have partisan agreement. Like it's just too hard to find agreement. However, uh, I conduct myself in a way that creates personal friendships with Republican senators. I'm proud to call uh, a number of them you know, personal friends. And uh, we have a lot of respect for each other. And I think the way we conduct ourselves um, is critical. So I never, so I would go out of my way, uh, you know, to not humiliate the other side. Um, and I think that does happen though, uh, in the Senate, in the House, and we need to not do that. Thank you. That's it. And Ms. Weber. I think the major quality that is needed is respect. A lot of the division and divisionary politics show a lack of respect. When I started in medicine, and even when I started at Fircrest, it was a very patriarchal system. It's evolved both in medicine and particularly at Fircrest, I've learned to work as a team. So the focus has been, what does the team think? What does the, you know, what recommendation is the team going to make? And that's been the focus. It's helped change my attitude and my expectations. Listening is always the most important, <clears throat> excuse me, activity one can do. Listening to the constituents, listening to your staff with whatever, policy, whatever information they want to share, listening to your peers, listening to both sides of the aisle and trying, perhaps not always understanding it, but at least giving them the respect of hearing them out and considering that their approach and their opposite view has some worth. Thank you. I'm going to offer a little extra time on the, the things we've asked questions about. We've talked about homelessness, hospital mergers, the education funding system, redistricting process, Roe versus Wade, climate change, violent firearms incidents, working productively. Take uh, 90 seconds if, there's, if you'd like to expand on your answer to any of those. I know sometimes things come to you later, and I think Mr. Solomon would lead on that. Sure, thank you. Um, there was a mention about loopholes in the Growth Management Act. Uh, and I'd like to say that I uh, worked really hard to close the, the major loophole in the Growth Management Act. Let me say that uh, regardless of whether climate change is explicitly spelled out uh, as a goal to try to reduce climate change in, in, in the Growth Management Act, let's call it the GMA for short, uh, building denser cities and not building houses in uh, agricultural areas, farmland, um, forest land is good at preventing climate change, right? You travel, less vehicle miles traveled, um, denser cities, less carbon emissions. That's just a fact. So um, for 20 years, we've been trying to change uh, a law that says that if a local government 
uh, ex allows, so it expands their boundaries, right? The city moves their boundaries out into farmland or agricultural land, forest land. Um, and a developer then applies to build in those areas. And the growth management state board says that the local government acted illegally and overturns that act those developers were still able to make those developments. So you had a situation where, you know, developers could elect their friends to the, to the local government. They'd do this thing. They knew it wouldn't stand. The developer would get in, get their plat in, and uh, still be able to develop, even though it was really legal. Finally, under after intense opposition uh, by the Republicans and the Building Industry Association of Washington, uh, I passed that bill. I introduced and passed that bill um, last year. It was our biggest environmental win, uh, according to members of the Washington Conservation uh, Voters Board, uh, and I'm very proud of it. Ms. Weber, any additional thoughts on the things we've talked about? Well, I, I'm going to go to my standby of mental health. We've there are current plans to make Western State more of a forensic institution and not a civilian institution. There are plans perhaps to have, uh, may I use the term halfway houses, group homes that the civilian population of Western State can be transferred. I haven't heard, a, that's, that's a great physical plan. What we need is a plan for continued wraparound services, continued support of those individuals that may face ongoing acute mental health crises. There is not just in Washington, but nationally, a shortage of psychiatrists. So a plan would need to understand how are we going to provide those ser services to the to its greatest ability to be distributed. And again, I'm going to go back to my teams. Can we have a plan where the psychiatrist is the head of the team? And then we have other multi-level practitioners or providers that can do day-to-day -day services with perhaps a weekly consultation with the psychiatrist. Psychiatry also is one of the fields that lends itself well to telehealth. And have we even developed a plan for continued telehealth consultation in providing those wraparound services those, for those people that need them? Thank you, Mr. Ms. Anthony, anything else on what we've talked about so far? I, I would just like to add on again to my concern about guns as it pertains to the crime and violence that is on our streets now. Um, I live near the Aurora corridor and you know the amount of smash and grabs and home invasions and, and all of these things, again, people are not getting these guns legally. So if they're not getting these guns legally, where are they coming from? I know that when I was doing organizing in uh, California, when I was doing organizing in California, um, we had a guy that came to one of our meetings that worked for the LAPD. And he talked about how they would come in uh, with chunks full of guns and then distribute them to the gangs. You know, So where are these guns coming from? It's not normal for a 12 and 13, 14 year old kid to have a gun. So I would just, um, really uh, implore that we really focus on the youth and that we find things for them to do. This is a creatively rich, uh, known all of the world for its creativity. And I feel that we can make before and after school programs for these young people to help, um, help with their talent and help with their mental health. And the arts can do all of that and get these young people off of the streets. Mm -hmm. And I know that uh, Seattle is one of the only places that has done a, a creative economy impact on how much money the arts bring into this region. And I think that the arts are the only way to uplift the spirit of this community and bring people together across all race, uh, gender, all of that. Because we all know that Washington is, is not doing well and I moved here from Montana, I love this place, and I just really wish that we would have practical legislation that deals with holistic issues. Thank you. Timer, let's do one minute on this. One last question of all, Ms. Weber, 
What didn't we ask about that you'd like to tell us about? What additional issues or information would you like to bring to the attention of the community? Quickly, 60 seconds. Economic growth and how we can provide more economic security, more along with that more food security, especially for those areas that we don't have a many in the North End, but in the South End, we have some food desert areas. People need food security, economic security to address the homelessness, to address the poverty level, which I think in turn will lead to addressing some of the crimes, giving people more self-respect, giving people more opportunities to achieve and not have to rely on crime or have to rely on hopelessness. Hopelessness is such a big problem leading to all these other pro societal problems that we see. Ms. Anthony. Um, elect election integrity. And election integrity is different than accusing someone of voter fraud. I think it's a complete delusion for anyone to think, oh, there's no possible thing that anything could go wrong. We all just perfectly are upstanding citizens and we all do the right thing. I think we need to put the integrity back because there is a narrative out there on different sides of the aisle uh, about our voting system and, and the people don't believe in it. And I think that that needs to be a reality check for us. The people do not believe in the system. So how do we uh, show the integrity of the system without talking points, but actually show them that, that our elections have integrity? Thank you. Mr. Solomon. Well, Karen, you didn't ask me about magic mushrooms, but why would you have? Um, so in all seriousness, uh, I have a bill 5660 that's got national attention. It was written up in the Politico, it was just uh, linked uh, by the New York Times, uh, that would legalize psilocybin therapy under a supervised, regulated, safe um, area, a container, so at a facility. The reason why that's, that's a real thing, a real bill, an important thing is Johns Hopkins University FDA approved studies have shown amazing uh, results in uh, PTSD therapy, tobacco and addiction therapy, better than the results that we get in all the other therapies that we have, talk therapy, things like that. Uh, so it's something that we need to move forward on. I have a bill to do it, and we have a task force together with the healthcare authority looking right at it right now. Thank you. The League appreciates these candidates for joining us and for running for office. A recording of this forum and others will be available on the League of Women Voters website, YouTube channel. Links are at lwvsnoho.org. We encourage you to explore additional information about these and all candidates. Snohomish County Voter Pamphlet will be mailed starting July 13th. Vote411.org, sponsored by the League, is another good source for nonpartisan voting information. Ballots will be mailed on July 15th. Election day is August 2nd. Please vote. This concludes our candidate forum. Thank you for joining us.